We are really excited to have you join us today for Chasing Sun in Shaded Yards. And we are, of course, hosted by the wonderful Napa County Library. So I wanted to introduce Stefna, who's a, a library staff who's helping us out tonight and um, let her do a little welcome for you as well. So go ahead, Stefna. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, welcome. Um, the Napa County Library, we've enjoyed this partnership with the UC Master Gardeners of Napa County. And each month, the group brings informative, engaging programs to our community. And tonight's program is Chasing Sun in Shade Yards. And I'd like to encourage you to please visit the home and garden section in our library to find materials that provide garden, gardening information. And I have a couple of books here. One is uh, Garden, garden Basics for Dummies by Stephen A. Frauen. And here's another book, The Complete Garden, Gardener's Guide, The One-Stop Guide to Plan, Sow, Plant, and Grow Your Garden. And each of these books, they have lists of plants and shrubs and ground covers that may work for your shaded garden. And we have a number of books that can help you uh, with your landscaping plans with regard to the different aspects of your garden. So please visit the Napa County Library. And um, if we don't have a book that you want, talk to us and we'll try to get it uh, to you through our Link Plus or Interlibrary Loan. Thank you, Yvonne. You're welcome. Thank you, Steph. Now we are, um, like I said, so thrilled to be partnering with the library and um, to bring these programs to you. Once a month, we're coming in to do um, a topic on gardening and I'm really excited about tonight's topic. Um, if we could have the next slide, Jane. Sorry. So as we get started, I just wanna remind everybody who we are as master gardeners. So we are a volunteer organization here in Napa County. We're county-based. There are master gardener programs throughout the whole United States, also throughout California. In almost every county in California, there's a master gardener program. So we are thrilled to bring this information to you from Napa County. So keep in mind that maybe some of the recommendations we make are specific to Napa County. So just keep that in mind if you're from another area. Um, but every county does have a master gardener program. So you can always reach out to your local program. The master gardeners throughout California have the same mission everywhere. We're all here to serve the community um, with home horticulture, pest management and sustainable landscaping practices based on the University of California research. And so that's why we're here to bring you that wonderful information. I also want to give you just a couple of notes about uh, technical stuff for tonight. If you want to maximize your screen, you can um, choose to minimize the view of the speaker um, so that you only see the speaker or even minimize it smaller so that you don't see any of the little pictures on the side here. We're going to audio and video mute everyone during the program except for our speaker. And we do ask if you have any questions or comments, you put them into the chat and you can find the chat usually towards the bottom of your screen or at the top, depending on your uh, system that you're using. And um, I think we have one more thing to ask you before we turn to the main program. So Jane, if I could have the next slide, please. Okay, so as part of our, our university research-based information and part of being part of the university, um, we are, always trying to make sure that we're serving our public. And one of the ways we show that we've done that is by sending you a follow-up survey. Now this survey is administered through the statewide program and it'll come out to you in a couple of months and they'll ask you just some very simple questions. It's about 10 questions on, did you use any of the information that we gave you tonight in our program? So if you want to opt out of this, you are welcome to opt out. If you want to do that, just type into the chat your first and last name that you logged in with so that we can find your email and not send you the survey. Otherwise, we'll send you the survey and you can, of course, not answer it if you don't want to, but that will give us a little bit of feedback and we'd love to have that if you are willing. So now I am going to turn it over to um, Jane, who is our guest speaker today. So go ahead, Jane. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to start off with a question. Does your yard have a limited supply of sunny places to grow vegetables in? With a little know-how, preparation, and access to gardening resources, you can maximize your ability to grow vegetables throughout the year in the Napa Valley. I've learned about gardening in shady places from experience. Our small property has five redwood trees, four fruit trees, and two sheds in the backyard 
which is where we grow vegetables, herbs, and flowers. Um, I neglected to label this. This is a raised bed here. This is the western border fence. This is the northern border. Our house is to the south. And on the other side of the five redwood trees is the mesclun cart, which you'll, uh, we'll talk about a little bit later. <clears throat> so buildings, fences, sheds, and trees all create shade. And these can block the sunlight your vegetable garden needs, making it hard to find a good spot for it. But the shadows that are cast change through the day and change with the seasons as the sun moves lower in the sky. So your, sun, your yard may not be as shady as you think. Most yards have microclimates, small pockets that are seasonally cooler or warmer or shadier or windier than the rest of your garden. You may have several microclimates in your yard. For example, you may have noticed the area near your house is warmer than areas in your yard further away. The raised beds in our backyard are protected by the redwood trees and on cooler nights, that area is warmer than the rest of the yard. In the summer, when many other yards are sizzling, because they're protected, that area, we can still grow lettuce and other green, leafy greens there. Most vegetables grow best in full sun. But as we know, not all open areas will be sunny because of shadows from tall trees and other hard structures. That means it's important to know where the sunlight is going to be to better plan your garden. So the first thing, oops. So the first thing to learn is where the sun will be in your yard through the seasons. Next, it's important to know the definitions of the levels of sun exposure and which plants do well in those levels. Lastly, we'll cover the overarching idea of right plant, right place, which refers to placing a plant in a location where its needs for sun and shade, soil and water are met allowing the plant to thrive and fight off pest and disease problems with minimal interference. One way to know the path of the sun in your yard and where the sun will be is to step outside in December at midnight during a full moon. The path the moon illuminates shows where the sun will be at 12 moon, noon, six months later. Now I admit it's not that easy for me to even stay up till 10 o'clock but a couple of times a year, I make an effort to, to come out during the full moon at midnight so that I can see the miracle of our solar system. It's magical to see the illumination of the moon and know that in six months and 12 hours, that will be the sun shining in your yard. This year, the full moon in December is on the 18th. So you'll be able to see where the sun will be shining at noon on June 18th a very useful visual to keep in mind. You can actually do this at any full moon at midnight to see where the sun will be in six months at noon. But these particular dates of December and June are very useful for growing a vegetable garden. By the way, the full moon in December is called a cold moon. Did you know that all the full moons have a different name? In April, the full moon is called a pink moon in May, it's a flower moon. And in June, it's a strawberry moon. For the rest, you can check space.com. Mapping your yard sunlight and shadows is a long-term project. So if you have just moved onto your property or it's your first time planting a garden there, you might consider planting in containers while you continue to map the sun and shade through the seasons. Another way to know where the sun will be is to notice each week where the shadows are. You can do this on the same day each week at nine o'clock, one o'clock and five o'clock. Of course, you can do this even more casually, but the smaller your yard is, the more important it is to find any pockets of light that may exist. So here's the raised bed and we can see the shadow. Ooh. I don't know how I can get this a little higher up here. Um, the shadows here are from the fruit trees to the south. 
And I've noticed that both ends of the, the east and west ends of the res bed are usually more sunny than this area. So I plant accordingly and the more tender plants are placed where it, it gets more shade. Um, these are shadows on a December morning. And you can see this is the western, um, the western edge of our yard. And so the shadows from the east are here and they will um, regress during the day and uh, the shadows from the fence will start to go north. And this picture is kind of important for us because it shows what happened when we one day realized that the sun was here all day and the shade from the fence uh, made this area dark earlier than we would have liked. But if we planted over here, we could have sun till 7.30 in the evening. And so that's when we started knowing that if you can't dig it in the ground, you can bring uh, the plant to the sun. Shadows at mid afternoon. This is the same Western end of the yard and here are the barrels. And we can see that they're in sun, whereas all the shade is coming here and anything that's not three feet high or taller is not getting any, any light. Um, and here is the other side of the barrels. They're casting their own shadows, but on the other side, you can see it's still sunny. Okay, let's talk about sun exposure and plant requirements. When full sun is the only light level listed for a plant, that means it's going to need at least six hours of sunlight a day. For vegetables, full sun means eight to 10 hours of direct sun a day or more. It need not be consecutive. This is especially true of fruiting crops, which I think need uh, more than 10 hours a day sometimes. I think tomatoes like 10 to 12 really. Um, so it's especially true of fruiting crops like tomatoes, corn, cucumbers, peppers, beans, and squash. When the seed pack or the plant label lists part sun to sun as the desired light, it will grow in both part sun and full sun, and it means a minimum of five to six hours of direct sun if possible. Root crops such as vegetable, uh, <clears throat> root crops such as radishes, carrots, and beets do well in part sun. When the label says part shade to shade, the plant prefers to grow in less than six hours of direct sun a day, about three to four hours. And most of that cool sun, meaning in the morning or early evening with protection from the hot midday sun. Leafy greens such as lettuces, chard, kale and spinach to name a few, tolerate the most shade. Vegetables use the sun to create food to nourish their cells and grow. Sunlight interacts with the plant's chlorophyll, the carbon dioxide in the air, and also water to produce starch and sugar inside the plant structure. All plants need some amount of light and the fastest growing vegetables require the most. So we can see here that part sun and part shade are not two sides of the same coin. Carrots, radishes, beets, and other root vegetables tolerate less than full sun but they still require hours of light to complete their photosynthesis needs. Shade tolerant vegetables like leafy greens, they develop dry curled leaves or brown blotches when they have sunlight in excess of their requirements. These plants thrive in cooler climates where moisture is more plentiful and they can easily scorch in the hot sun. Dappled sun or sunlight filtered through trees provides part sun and part shade microclimates that can be ideal for growing some vegetables that wither in direct sun. Additionally, partially sunny or shady areas provide an opportunity to extend cool season crops, such as broccoli and cauliflower from spring into early summer. A little shade in late spring will help keep leafy greens from bolting as temperatures rise. You can also use plant orientation. Where am I? Sun exposure. We can also use plant orientation to provide extra shade for leafy greens. For example, 
we always plant taller plants to the north of shorter ones to avoid having their shadows stunt the growth of shorter plants. You can easily modify this idea if you find you will need a little more shade for your leafy greens, and you can plant them to the north of taller ones so you can help provide more shade. A full garden planted in dappled light in late summer will be established when leaves fall in the autumn and cooler temperatures and the extra sunlight available from the fallen leaves can help the growth of your cool season vegetables. Other ways to extend the available sunlight in your yard include using movable pots and containers and trellising vining and climbing plants to maximize the sun and space in smaller yards. The mesclun cart here is another example of bringing the plants to the sun if there's no place in the sun to put them in the ground. Now here we have an axle with two wheels in the back. There used to be a wheel in the front and we used to wheel this every season around the yard to see where it liked best. All we grow in here are baby lettuces, mesclun, mixed greens. And so every season we would move it and we finally found it's forever home. And I think right now it doesn't have wheels on it at all. It just has milk uh, crates because it lives here now. Uh, the sun is perfect. Uh, and wouldn't you know, it's the farthest away from the hose. And here we have trellis vining and climbing plants to maximize sun and space in small yards. Here in mid-July, the kabacha is starting to climb the fabric cloth and the trellis and the pole beans are starting to climb up and they meet in the middle and they cross over. And in the winter and very, very late winter and early spring, nothing grows here. Uh, I just have it mulched with straw because there's not enough light. The light is too weak. Here is the mesclun cart again, and you can see seeds sprouting in early November. And this illustrates the Persephone period. If you want to grow all season, throughout the seasons in the Napa Valley, you must know about the Persephone period, which you can read about, as I did, in Helen Dake's wonderful article in Spill the Beans, which is on our website, from a Napa Register article on August 24th, 2018. And in it, she describes the period in ancient times when Persephone, the goddess of spring, was captured by Hades and brought to the underworld to be his bride. Ancient farmers believed that her mother, Demeter, the goddess of agriculture and harvest, was so enraged that she withheld fertility and plant growth until Zeus arranged for Persephone to be returned to earth. But because she had eaten some pomegranate seeds when there, each year she has to return to the underworld for four months, during which time Demeter grieves for her daughter and plants go dormant until Persephone's annual return to earth in the spring. Knowing when the Persephone days begin, and of course we understand now that it was the ancient farmer's metaphor for the time of year when days have fewer than 10 hours of sunlight, these will help you plan for a productive winter garden. The key is to have your seedlings growing before the shorter days begin. In Napa, that means in September or October or even earlier. And the mesclun grows during that time, but if it's just planted, it will not. They have, it has to be already established to survive when there's fewer hours than 10 of sunlight. Here's some more illustrations of the principles of sun exposure and orientation. These are to the north, so their shadows never fall on the shorter plants. And these are so short that they never bother the taller plants. And at 2.15 on July 14th, same day, this is the north side of the bed. And we can see the climbing plants. It's got some nice cucumbers there and some shade cloth. And you're wondering, she's got five redwood trees in her backyard. This is called chasing sun. Why the heck does she have shade cloth on her bed? Well, let me tell you, five sequoia redwoods dump an awful lot of detritus in the yard. And the shade cloth saves me hours of pulling all the, the cones and the, and the uh, 
needles and all the little branches and twigs, it saves me hours. So I put up with the shade cloth because I have to. And sun exposure, take advantage of shady areas on really hot days. We have some chubby buddies over here and we have a little kitty taking advantage underneath the shade of a patio tomato plant. The philosophy of right plant, right place means to give your plants the conditions they desire and they will reward you many times over. Right plant, right place means understand the conditions you have in your garden, then look for lists of plants based on similar growing conditions. It means choose plants suited to the locations you plant them in. Healthy plants are better equipped to withstand any problems of pests and disease than those struggling with their environment. I know a gardener who plants the same varietal in three different places to see which it prefers. I don't have the space to do that, but I do tuck extra seedlings into spaces I think will suit them instead of always planting them in the same row. Your selected locations should meet plants requirements for sun, soil, water, and also spacing. Plants that are too close together don't receive their full allotment of sun and lack of air circulation can encourage pests and disease. You can buy many seedlings at nurseries and garden centers, but for the biggest selection, check out nursery seed racks or order from seed companies and catalogs. So this is a mixture. I've got seedlings here that I've purchased, seedlings that friends have traded with me, and then there are the seeds that I've planted myself. Um, we discussed sun requirements earlier, and as you can see, seed packets and plant tags often give that information, although I find that seed packets always have more information than plant tags. But this one does. It has AM sun and shade. This one I find a little interesting. It's sea of red lettuce, and yet it says full sun. And full sun, it depends where in the yard your full sun is and how many hours it gets because you can fry your, your tender greens too. So um, full sun is a good theory, but you should read the rest of the plant, plant, plant packet to make sure. Now we talked about sun, as I said, but soil requirements are more forgiving in that you can amend your soil to make it more hospitable for the plants you want to grow. So let's talk about soil texture. The relative proportions of sand, silt, and clay are some of the most important physical properties affecting plant growth because they determine nutrient and water holding capacities which generally tells you the fitness of your soil as a medium for growth. Light sandy soils have large pore spaces that allow water and nutrients to drain away freely. That's because sandy soils are low in organic matter and water holding capacity. Conversely, heavy clay soils have tiny particles all packed together helping to hold the greatest volume of nutrients in soluble form, but, it's, but they're very sticky when wet and they are very hard when dry and they are very slow to drain, which means your delicate plant roots may be sitting in water for longer than is healthy. The feel method is a quick and dirty method no pun intended, for you to get an idea about what you're working with in your garden. The ideal soil type for growing vegetables is loamy soil. Sandy soil feels gritty and rough and it doesn't form balls when it's damp. Clay soil feels sticky and moldable when it's wet, but it feels compact and hard when it's dry. Loamy soil is moderately coarse, with 10% organic matter. The smaller pores, it has, I'm sorry. It contains particles of various sizes, loamy soil does, organic matter and enough air for healthy root growth. 
It drains well, but does not dry out or lose nutrients quickly. The smaller pores retain water while the larger ones drain and allow air to enter the soil. Adding composted material and mulch help make the soil more loamy. When preparing your soil for planting, dig in some compost or soil conditioners. You can pick up some good bagged ones at local nurseries. Light, loose, well-amended soil makes it easier for roots to penetrate and retains nutrients and drains better. Raised beds are a quick way to start a vegetable garden. You can add light commercial topsoil soil and compost and mulch for good drainage and the bed will warm quickly in sunny weather. After planting, which is what I'm describing here, these aren't raised beds. Um, after planting, add straw or compost or bark to the soil surface about two to four inches deep. This will help retain moisture, protect the soil from compaction, reduce erosion and suppress weeds. So I have it here on the ground and also in barrels. We get bales of straw and my husband cuts them with a, a saw and slices them. And so the pieces are a little more uh, manageable uh, to use as mulch. Straw or compost will also enrich your soil with organic matter as it decomposes. And just a note, the Napa Master Gardeners Climate and Soils team offers workshops about the importance of healthy soil. So let's talk about water. Like people, most plants cannot survive long without water. A seed must absorb water before it can germinate. Roots take up nutrients only when water is present in the soil. Water transports nutrients throughout plants and water is essential for photosynthesis. Water in the soil is held in gaps between the soil particles and is absorbed by tiny delicate root hairs. So the texture of your soil absolutely determines your watering needs. The texture of your soil will help you to determine the water holding capacity of your garden soil so you understand how much to water. So the first rule of watering is know your soil. Then choose the right plants for your garden sun and soil conditions. Experts agree that the best method of garden irrigation is drip irrigation if possible. Other methods of irrigation may be fine. We've only had drip irrigation for three years and we managed to garden plenty without it. But if you ever have the opportunity to install it, you will be so glad. It saves so much time and it's very efficient. Efficient watering means putting the right amount of water in the right place when plants need it without excess or runoff or other waste. We are living in a summer dry Mediterranean climate that is becoming more and more prone to drought. So grouping plants in hydrozones where all the plants in one area have the same water needs is very helpful. The advantages of efficient watering are lower water use, less waste water, and ease of watering. Remember to check your watering system throughout the seasons. Even though it is still hot in September, our gardens need only about 60% of the water they need in July. In October, they need only 30%. This is because plants determine their water needs by daylight hours, not by temperature. Um, in Spill the Beans, Suzanne Rottenberg, Roth, Roth, Rottenberg has a fabulous article in 2019, uh, around the same time of year as the other one. I have the link at the end of this presentation, but it's called, How Much Should I Water? And it iterates a lot of what I've said here, what I've found. And so I added it because she's a really good writer. Okay, so it's important to monitor our irrigation timing throughout the seasons 
so we can make adjustments as needed. And if we remember to mulch heavily, we can save 20 to 30 gallons of, uh, per 1,000 square feet when we water. So here's just, this is before I mulched, this is just with the irrigation. And here is the irrigation in the carrot bed. And I believe I have a circle looped of uh, emitters around the Watsonia bulbs in this bed. And here's the irrigation laid out here uh, on the east, on the western bed. And you can see this is still sunny, and here we are in the shadows. And then this is another illustration of irrigation and shadows. And so you can see the irrigation I've got coiled around these little tomato seedlings here. Most of the tomatoes are going to be in the sunnier area. The Water Wise Gardening in the Napa Valley website, which is on our resources slide and is put up by the city of Napa, recommends selecting plants appropriate for a Mediterranean climate, depending where in the valley you live. It recommends mulching and it recommends continually adjusting irrigation to conserve water, a perfect example of right plant, right place. So you can see, you can plant your garden to take advantage of the growing seasons in the Napa Valley. It's possible to grow all year, especially varietals that are adapted to our area. You can find some examples of this by going to the Master Gardener homepage, which is right here, where you can look up month-by-month uh, -month planting in Napa, a planting and harvesting guide, a vegetable planting guide, and information about treating garden pests and diseases, just to name a few. So here's a list of useful resources for the home gardener, just of the few of the many resources available online and in print. I think a lot of people have the new Sunset Western Garden book. And um, at the beginning of this presentation, we saw the books that were available in the library. So there are lots of resources available for you to help uh, grow, a garden through the seasons of the year in Napa. Yvonne? Oops, let me unmute, sorry, muted. Um, <laughs> uh, you can find this slideshow and all the resources they'll be posted on our website in, um, it takes us a few days to get it edited and put up, but you'll find it on our website um, if you wanna review anything or to share it with a friend. We also want to ask you some questions. So we're going to ask you for your questions as, as you think of them. Um, go ahead and type them into the chat. But before we do that, I want to ask you um, a little question on a poll. Um, oh, yeah, let's do that first. Sorry. <laughs> Next slide. So if when you go to our main website, you can find these resources that we've listed, the, the references of past workshops and other events that we've done. You can find them on our website. If you go to events, find us. And then on the events, find us page at the very top is references and slides, workshops and events. And this is where we post all of the recordings from our Zoom presentations. And we've had many of these over the last year and a half, as you well know, uh, many of our Zoom programs have been posted here. So you can go back and review lots of great information. And before we go much further, I do want to, now I'll launch the poll. <laughs> so we're just going to ask you a quick question uh, before we get into your questions is we hope that you've learned something tonight that's useful um, to determine seasonal sun and shade patterns. So the poll should be up on your screen. Just go ahead and choose yes or no. And I'll just give everybody a couple of, couple of seconds here to answer. Okay, that's just about everybody. And, and now I'm going to show you what, what you said. <laughs> it looks like everybody found something to share and use on this program. Hey. Wonderful. Well, the other part of that question is, since you did find something interesting, we hope that you're inspired. And so we wanted to ask you if you are going to use some of this information to change something that you're doing in your garden, maybe grow a new crop, maybe grow a new plant, plant something in a different spot. And if you have any of those kinds of comments, please chat, uh, type it into the chat for us because we'd love to know what you're going to try 
um, in your garden after seeing this presentation. And we can go to the next slide, which is just asking if you have any further questions. So far, I don't see any questions. Any, any inspirations of what you wanna do different in your yard after hearing this presentation? I have to say, I'm very excited to go out at midnight and look at the full moon <laughs> and figure out where the sun is gonna be in, in June. <laughs> Anybody else gonna do that? Go out at midnight? <laughs> Ah, here's a question. Um, any suggestions for softening hard clay soil? And we have some team members here who can chime in as well. Compost, mulch. I, you know, we used to hear about this famous elixir that fixes everything. And I think compost fits the bill. Any type of soil is benefited by adding compost, even just as a top mulch. The worms will lurk it into the ground for you. and. I've seen fabulous things done by just adding a layer of compost every year to your soil. So um, it works wonders. And the straw mulch works really well. It lasts longer than the compost. So you can put the compost down and then put the straw over the top and you'll get rid of a lot of your weed problems as well. Um, so somebody is commenting, I uh, never knew that water needs were determined by sun time, not temperature. She is going to be adjusting her drip timing accordingly. Good job. Thanks, Janice. Um, Carol's saying she will definitely use, uh, use more straw for mulching. Josh is saying, thank you. Uh, Bill and I are going to go out at midnight on the full moon. Sounds interesting. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's fabulous. It, it is really fun. You know, we did a library presentation not too long ago about moon gardens and looking at the moon, uh, what shows and where the shadows are in your garden and planting plants that have white flowers or light foliage just to kind of benefit that um, oh, the in the nighttime. Yeah, moon garden. Um, let's see. Terry says, I've been looking for this kind of help for a long time, and she's excited about watching the sun and the shadows. Oh, goody. <laughs> Christine's saying, uh, yes, the full moon fact is very cool and interesting. Um, we're going to try our, Candy is saying, we're going to try our luck with spinach and carrots during this season. Um, is a hoop house recommended or just for the spring and summer for spinach and carrots? I don't think you would need a hoop house, would you? You think they're going to get frosted? Maybe the spinach. Yeah, the spinach might. But they kind of like the colder weather, don't they? A lot of our, um, I know a lot of the coal crops, things like um, cauliflower, broccoli, kale, and those crops, this is not include spinach, but um, some of those crops actually are improved with the cold temperatures. They actually get more sugar in their content because it's their antifreeze. And so right, when right. it's the cold nights, all of your, um, your cold crops will actually taste sweeter and be better after we have a couple of cold nights. So I'm very excited to harvest some of my broccoli that's now fruiting, so. Um, but I don't know. Um, I know some of the lettuces are a little bit tender and might need some protection, but. Hoop houses are, they can get very hot during the day um, if you don't lift up the sides and let some of the air get in too. So you do have to be careful with that. Right now we're having very cold nights, but very warm days. So you can really burn plants if you've got too much cover on them. Um, somebody's asking, Christian's asking, what was the watering percentage difference for October and December in comparison to summer? I think 60% uh, of water in October that you need in July. Mm -hmm. Yeah, July is like- and, Wait, wait, wait. 60% in, in September and in October, they only need 30% oh. of what, what you give them in July. I don't know about December. I didn't research that. <laughs> and, and I think it may be um, as we go into these drought years, that might be you know, often you don't need to water much at all in the winter because it's so cool and very low sun um, exposure. Plants don't need a lot of water, but as we go into these drought years, you do need to do some watering during the winter. It's yeah, as the water table gets shallower and shallower. Yes, and I've noticed with my um, in my raised beds where I have some seeds that I planted because they're so shallow, I needed to water them very lightly, but I needed to water them a couple of times um, during the week just to keep them moist. So. Right, and when the roots are, are longer, then you can water them less often and more deeply as, as we noted earlier. 
with the irrigation uh, slide. Thank you, everybody. Lots of good questions. Thank you, everyone.